Welcome to Menopause Morph, your time to change. We're here to help you thrive through your menopause, bringing you experts in many fields to help you from perimenopause to menopause and beyond to become the strong, vibrant woman nature intended you to be. Hosted by Pauline McCarthy of the Pearls of Pauline. Pearls of wisdom, compassion, and joy. Hello, welcome to this week's Menopause Morph, your time to change. Today we have a lovely lady from living in Texas, but originally from Tennessee, and her name is Laura Sims. Laura is an expert in modern, meaningful careers who challenges conventional wisdom by asking people to ditch their passions and start with purpose. After struggling through her own career transition, Laura developed Your Career Homecoming, her signature career change process to help people find careers that feel like home. This unorthodox curriculum sidesteps the familiar refrains to either follow your passion or be practical by emphasising service, legacy and each individual's personal relationship to purpose. Working with clients internationally, Laura is proving that the purpose-driven approach leads to meaningful, profitable careers. She reluctantly lives in Texas and loves spending time on the front porch with her husband, sons, friends and guitar. So welcome, Laura. (laughs) Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So it's I'm sure some of our listeners will be thinking, why is she talking to some a, a, a career coach? I, I've been in my career like for 30, 35 years now or something. But our topic t- tonight is, or today, tonight depends on which part of the world you're in, is are you happy in your career? I mean, is it the career that really you're suited for? Or was it the career that your parents sort of forced you into or you were you take you just took the first job because you needed to pay the bills? So Laura has a lot of experience in this and... So Laura, can you tell us, most of your people, what are their, what are their feelings towards their career? Why are they thinking to change their careers? You know, I work with, with people age 20 through 60, but I would say, you know, a lot of people that are in your generation, the, the, the big patterns I see are they got into a career way back when, um, you know, when they were first getting out of school because it seemed practical. It was something their parents advised them to do. Um, the job was related to whatever they had studied or whatever kind of talents they had. And they kind of got in it. And then life happened. They have a family, you know, there's a mortgage to pay. And they just kind of stay on this track that they got in to begin with. And maybe that track made sense at the time. And now what they want has changed. Or maybe it was never a great fit to begin with. It looked good on paper or it made sense to mom and dad. And they have dutifully, you know, gone through the steps of of doing the work and, and even, you know, working up the ladder and doing a very good job at this work. And then they get to a point in their lives where you know, maybe the nest is empty, or maybe they're starting to look back over their career and and question what they've accomplished and who it matters to and look at how they want to spend the rest of their working lives and realize that they want to do something different. They want to do something more meaningful. They want to do something that's going to be more fulfilling for them personally. So I think a lot of times it's not necessarily that there's an impetus at work that makes people want to change. It's it's something within them, something within their lives, um, where they start really asking the hard questions of how have I spent my time? Is this what I want moving forward? Yeah. So uh, if I give you an example, let's say we have a menopausal lady and she's, or perimenopausal, she's 45 and she's been in the job for 20, 20 years after university and she's not really quite happy. So what advice would you give her? I would say, first of all, find ways to find happiness outside of work, because yes, it's important to have fulfilling work and we can, uh, there are things we can do about that. But I think one mistake people make is expecting work to be everything for us. So I would say, make sure you're cultivating some interests and relationships outside of work. Another thing I would say is within your position, you know, so if we're not even talking about changing careers, see what you can adjust within the job that you have. You know, is there an opportunity for you to learn new skills? Are you able to take on a slightly different role or or maybe even play a smaller role in a project that you normally wouldn't be involved with just to give yourself some variety and, and the opportunity to learn something new? And then if we're talking about, okay, let's find a way to leave this other career behind to not just think about the skills that you've acquired and the things that you're good at, but to also think about your sense of purpose and why you want to work to begin with. 
Is there a change that you want to make? Is there a life experience you've had that allows you to see something or do something in a way that other people can't? I find that for most people, that's where the really fulfilling stuff happens is when you're looking at based on my skills and my life experience and my perspective on the world, what do I want to help create? That's when it gets really fun and exciting. Yeah. So as you were mentioning in, in, in your introduction, most people are saying, like, do what you love, do what you love. But you're actually saying to people, do, do something more with a purpose. Yeah, you know, and I think do what you love is not bad advice. I think it can be incomplete for most people. So you can go off and chase a passion, but oftentimes those things can be difficult to monetize. Now, I'm not saying again that you shouldn't, you know, if you love painting, you can try to make a living as a painter or, you know, that's, that's using kind of the activity as the, the primary thing that you are trying to form a career around. Instead of looking at the, the activity or the passion, I'm saying, let's look at that sense of purpose. Let's look at something that's more relational. So the painter who wants to be a professional painter, it's probably for her about being in the studio, feeling lost, kind of getting in the flow, the experience she has, the enjoyment she has of that activity. If it's something more purpose-oriented, Yes, it's something she'll still enjoy, but it's also about her connection outside of herself. How does it help someone else? How does it inform their experience or their life or what they need? That, that's, that's really fulfilling. Yeah. And could you give us some examples of people that have really changed their career like 360 degrees? <laughs> <laughs> Come out with yeah. this sun shining out their backside? <laughs> <laughs> You know, for some people, it's not a matter of changing what they do. It's a matter of changing their the environment that they're working in. So, for example, I worked with a woman who did very technical work doing stuff with, a, with construction sites. And she realized that she really liked the engineering aspect of her work, but she was in a horrible environment where she didn't feel supported. She didn't feel challenged. She wasn't given the resources she needed. And, and not long after working together, she found another job in her same field, but where she was treated like somebody <laughs> and she was given the resources and support that she needed. So that's not a huge shift in terms of going from here to here, but it made a huge difference in her life. Somebody who's done something a little more drastic. I worked with a woman who had her own business and she helped people with, you know, their online presence with social media and things like that. And, you know, she had been pretty content to have her own business for a while, but um, eventually that wasn't feeling very meaningful for her. And she ended up quitting her business to go into radio journalism. She discovered that what she was really interested in was helping to tell the stories of people whose story were not being heard. And so it was interesting because there are certainly some similarities and some skill crossover from what she was doing to what she ended up doing, but completely different fields. Okay. And has there been somebody that accidentally found a, a new career and found that that was the best thing for them? You know, accidentally uh you know <laughs> i'll tell you i'll give you an, i'll give you an example i accidentally right. i accidentally started a souvenir candy company <laughs> i had no interest in well of course i love candy yes uh, but i had no interest in running a business of souvenir candy or or anything to do with candy but what happened was i it was christmas oh about five years ago i think and as you can hear from my accent, I'm Scottish, so but I live in Iceland. I've got a lovely Icelandic husband. And we went to visit my family in Scotland. And I have so many brothers and sisters. I have nine brothers and sisters. So I have a lot of nieces and nephews. So I brought, I went to, I bought a big container of candy for each family, you know, just to give for Christmas. And I said to the eldest of each family, share that amongst your brothers and sisters. That's Icelandic candy. And one of them came up to me and he said, Auntie Pauline, why are you telling me lies? I went, what do you mean lies? He said, you said this is Icelandic candy? I said, yes, it is. He said, well, how come it says made in Denmark? <laughs> Very small print, you know. And in Iceland, you know, I had just gone to the supermarket and got a big tub. And I thought about it and I thought, you know, it's true. There's nothing in Iceland that actually says this is Icelandic candy in big print. You know, it's like if you go to New York, you'll get a picture with the Statue of Liberty on it. If you go to London, you'll get Big Ben. If you go to Paris, you'll get Eiffel Tower. If you go to Iceland, you were just go told to go to the supermarket. You know, it's like, <laughs> and I thought, you know, this is not good. You know, Iceland is really, it's a beautiful country. And this was just after they had, you know, the volcano that went off. It's called Eyjafjallajökull. 
Not everybody can say that. <laughs> and it was stopping the aeroplanes coming from, you know, Europe and America. So it was on the news all over the world. So ever since that, the, the tourism in Iceland was increasing 20% every year, which is a lot. This year, they're expecting it to be 35%. So at the time, we, you know, we had just went through this economic crash in Iceland in 2008. And we were really struggling financially because basically we lost everything and more. But we still had the roof over our head. But we wouldn't have it for very long unless we, we found something. And I had been trying all sorts of other ideas, art projects and doing some more acting and singing and things. But it still wasn't bringing in the income that I needed. And so this this idea came to me and said, you know, Iceland doesn't have any souvenir candy. So there's there's no competition. So one of the things I do is is arts. Like I was very enjoying you saying be an artist, you know, because there is no <laughs> money in being an artist, believe me. <laughs> but it's it's very enjoyable, you know. So I had this idea, I'm going to draw pictures of puffins or or oil paint pictures of puffins and volcanoes and stuff like this and package it, you know, and just get traditional Icelandic candy and package it in this packaging. And I had but I had no money, you know, I was like <laughs> And I went along to the, I, I wrote, a, a, you know, I, I had been studying internet marketing. So I had a little bit idea beginning to be about business because most of my life I had been a, a missionary. So I was always just helping people, but never thinking about money. But now was the time, you know, they say charity begins at home. So sometimes you have to think about money. And so I, I learned uh, you have to write this confidentiality clause. So I wrote the confidentiality clause and I went to the candy company and I said, I have a brilliant idea, but you have to sign this before I tell you it. Okay, so they signed it. And then I said, okay, so from now on, I'm going to be buying lots and lots of candy from you, but I'm going to put it in my packaging. So I just need it from you in like in a clear plastic bag and I'll put it in my boxes or tins or whatever. So he said, yeah, that's a great idea. He says, and we don't sell in these niche, you know, they sell in supermarkets and they didn't sell in the tourist shops. Because actually when I came back from Scotland, I went straight into a tourist shop and I just pretended to be a tourist. You know. Oh, do you have any candy? Oh, no, if you want candy, you have to go up to the supermarket. I said, no, no, I don't want supermarket candy. I want stuff, puffins and volcanoes and Icelandic horses and stuff like that. She went, oh, we don't have that. And I'm thinking, well, you will have soon. <laughs> <laughs> and so so the guy said, this is great, this is great. And I said, okay, there's just one small problem. Okay, what's that? I said, the problem is I have no money. You know, and I says, all I have is debt. I says, but this is a really, really brilliant idea. And it's if, as if, if you can give me some credit, I can guarantee that I'll be buying a lot, a lot, a lot from you. So he said, okay, let me go and talk to my boss. So he comes back about 10 minutes later and he said, the boss has said that you can get to the end of the month plus 30 days. And then I went along to the, the the printing company and I gave them the same story. I said I need credit, you know. And they gave, and then later on, when they went, you know, after I'd been in business a few months, and I I started hanging out with business people, at, you know, at conferences and things like that. And I was telling people my story, and they said you got credit from that candy company. They never give anybody credit. The, the only people that get credit are people that have been big, big, giant supermarket chains that have been with them for years. And I says, well, I got it right away, you know. And it was like, it was like all the karma chips were coming in, you know, to, to help, you know. And now in the summertime, we sell one ton of candy every every month. Wow. So it was just, I, I was, it was an accidental, what do you call it? Career change. <laughs> well, and but I think you, you did something really smart, which was you, what you didn't do is sit down and think, what can I do? What can I do and make a list of candy, tourism? You know, this, this is an idea that came about very organically. You saw a problem or you saw an opportunity. You looked around at what else was out there. You saw a vacuum in the market and you asked for what you needed. So I mean, you can say it's an accident and you just fell into it, but you're the one who had to go to the coffee, you know, I mean, the uh, the candy people, you're the one who had to go to the printer and do the legwork. So it didn't quite fall into your lap. You, you had to go out and, and hustle to make it happen. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, that's a completely valid way for, for you to get into a career. Those are harder to go out and seek right? Because you just kind of saw this opportunity. So I think, you know, um, maybe a lesson for the listeners as well is pay attention. You know, when you, when you see an opportunity or you see something you think is, is a problem or a lack, start looking around at how you might create a solution for it. Yeah. I think a lot of women in the, the, the change of life years, they're looking for a change and it could be that they don't have to change careers. It could be that they start their own career, like start their own business. And, Absolutely. Uh, 
And uh, one thing that I like to talk about with clients is the idea of having a career crossfade. So one of the big fears with career change is, well, how do I, you know, I don't want to just leave my job and start something new that I don't have any guarantee that the new thing is going to work. Mm -hmm. So I say, okay, instead of just an abrupt stop and start, let's have a crossfade. Let's have a transition period where you're fading out the old career and fading into the new career. Mm -hmm. So that might look like while I stay at my day job, I'm researching candy. (laughs) I'm finding if someone will give me credit for it. I'm putting together the artwork to make a wrapper. I'm putting out, you know, I'm, I'm working with a single boutique or tourist shop to see if it will sell in their shop. So you experiment on a small scale till you can build up your experience and your confidence. You've got at least some knowledge that what you want to do will work. And then you can gradually let go of that other career instead of just an abrupt start and stop. Yes. I know that a lot of people that go into internet marketing or doing something, selling their products online, they start at night or at the weekend. So they have their day job. And I would mm-hmm. I would definitely say to people, don't give up your day job until the money starts to come in. <laughs> I mean, you do hear of some people that they say, oh no, if I don't give up my job, then I'll never do it. And they give up their job and they have like only enough money to last for two months. And, they, and that gives them the impetus to push to get, a, to get a result. But it doesn't always work for everybody. There's not a happy ending for everybody. So it's, as you say, it's, this transition period is much, much safer. And, you know, also, if you're going to quit your your steady, stable job to start something new, you're right, it sometimes does work out for people because they've got kind of that pressure, but sometimes the pressure can backfire. And now not only do you have to get this fledgling business up off the ground and get it profitable, you've got to do it within this limited time window before your, you know, your savings runs out. And that pressure that does some people it will motivate some people it will just shut them down and kind of cripple them and they won't perform well under it Um, it's a lot to ask for a brand new business to support you immediately so that's why I like to give it a chance to kind of for you to figure things out and for it to get its legs under itself I think for those that that aren't I think the biggest problem people have is fear fear of change fear of changing their career or starting or starting a business so Do you have any advice on how people can allay those fears apart from the transition thing, but are there other ways that people can do their homework in a sense so that they they don't, they're not so scared? Mm -hmm. You know, as part of that transition period, I always recommend a a period of what I call field work. So that's when you are getting on the phone, you're sending emails, you're having coffee dates with people who are doing something similar. So you find out not just how this career looks on paper, but how it operates in the real world. What is your day like? Who do I need to know? What do I need to know? So you've got just a more real world look at what that career is like. And then I think one of the big fears that I see with people in terms of their career, besides the practical aspects of how will I do it? What's the money going to look like? For a lot of people, their sense of identity is very closely linked to their job. So if it's not the practical stuff, the other question is, who am I? If I'm not this job, Mm -hmm. what will my family think of me if I try something and it doesn't work? Or even if it does work, will my spouse support me with this crazy idea that I have? You know, what will I think of myself if I go out on a limb and do something new? You know, and that's where things like journaling or having a friend to talk to, you know, someone that you trust and is not going to laugh at your big ideas, you know, working in a, in a small group setting or with a mentor or with a coach, reading success stories of people who have done something similar so that you, so that the thing that you want to do doesn't seem so out there. It seems grounded. It seems like something that people do and it seems like something you can do. And you can a- allow that sense of identity to to kind of grow and shift as your career is growing and shifting. I think the, the biggest thing then is to be flexible and be open-minded. Right. Isn't it? Yeah. Right. And something you were saying earlier about your clients, the age group, a lot of people, like I'm 55 and people will say, oh, I could never change my career at 55. You know, I'm, I'm so near retirement age, but yeah, it's like another 10 years, like that's a long time. And even I remember my grandfather, when he retired, he says, I can't sit still and just be home and reading the newspaper. So he went out and he did a paper round, you know, like, which was like for, you know, young kids. But he said he he loved it. And he would walk and he'd talk to people on the street. And, you know, he had a great time. And then my, my other grandfather, he 
he became a courier. He was taking legal letters from, a, a, you know, the, the lawyer's office to the other's office because they by, they couldn't be taken in the post in case they got lost. They were so important. And he was walking around the city centre and he said it was great. He'd go in and, it, and he'd chat up the young girls behind the desk. You know, and he was like 90 <laughs> years old. <laughs> so I think it's never too late to to change your career. So in your your clients, what what is the upper age limit that not age limit, but the age group that you have been helping to change a career? I think probably the oldest client I've personally worked with has been just shy of 60. But I don't think the rules change as you get older. Now, what you are looking for might change, you know, but if it's something you're intimidated by, if it's something you think, well, I've done this one thing for so many years, surely no one will want me for anything else. Things are a lot more flexible than they were 20, 30, 40 years ago. So, you know, if you're having trouble figuring out how do I take what I've done and translate those skills and that experience, find someone who will help you, you know, find someone who is used to being on the job market and doing all the job searches and writing resumes and all of this, figure out how to best package and communicate the value that you can bring to the workplace. And then once that's done, it's going to be about finding a workplace and an employer who values what you do have. So for any age group, there's going to be, you know, bosses that they see what's on your resume and they're not interested. And that doesn't mean that what's on your resume is not valuable. It means it's not valuable to them. Exactly. So I would say don't, you know, don't, don't diminish the incredible work history and all the experience you have. Learn how to communicate it, how to display it and find the people who are going to value that. You know, that actually reminds me of my father. My father, when he went in, he was a welder in the shipyards in Glasgow. And in the, in the fifties and sixties, Glasgow was like one of the biggest places in the world for shipbuilding. And then in the seventies, you know, shipbuilding started getting, it was in Taiwan and Korea and, and, and all at, when I, when I was born, there was 20 shipyards in Glasgow. 20. Can you imagine? And Glasgow only has one million of a population. So that's a lot of shipyards, you know, today they have one. Mm. And in the seventies, they were closing them down like this. You know? And my dad, because my dad was such a good worker, he was kept on. He was actually employed, you know, he got taken on from the, the shipyard he was working in to shut down, but he was taken on in another one because he was so well known as being very good in his in his welding, whatever. But he had his passion and he'd always said, that, I remember when my first career was in medical science and my father said to me, you are so lucky to be able to get a job that you love doing, you love doing science. And he says, I would love to do a job that I would like to do. He says, but I had to do a job that would bring in the most money for my family. And he had a lot of family, you know, he had 10 children, you know. <laughs> and so I, I said to him then, and I think, I, well, I was, I would have been about 17 or 18, something like that. And he, I said to him, well, what kind of work would you like to do? And he says, I always would like, I've always wanted to work with children. And I says, is that why you had so many children? He says, yeah, no, I just love children. <laughs> no, Irish Catholics, you know. But he said, no, that's what I would really, he says, not just working with children, he says, but really helping children that are having a difficult time. He says, because there's so many kids that turn out bad because nobody's loving them enough. And I thought, oh, and my dad, he's a wonderful, wonderful man, you know. So a few years later, you know, the shipyard that he was in was shutting down and he was unemployed and he didn't give up. And he he was doing a lot of charity work while he was looking for, for, for jobs. And one of the things he was doing was he was helping out in the local election campaign or something like that. I can't remember now. Something to do with politics. I'm not a politi political person, so I don't know. I just know it was something to do with politics. And one of the guys that was in this political group, he said to my father, Pat, there's a, there's a job going for a social worker in the boys' home. And he says, I think you would be great at it. And he said, but I, I've got no degree. And my father actually, my father is a very, very intellectual man, but when he was 15, he broke his back and he was in hospital for a few years and missed his exams. So he never, he never got to a university. So he, he went straight from the hospital into work in the shipyards, you know, to learn to be a welder. But, and the, this, um, this politician guy, he said to him, Pat, he says, that's not like you to give up like that. He says, you're, 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 you're the person who's always telling people you can do anything. He says, you can do this. Go for it. You know, so my father went to the, what do you call it? The um, interview. You know? And he said, he said, I was sitting there in this room and it was all young men straight out of university with their social worker degrees or, you know, so sociology degrees and stuff like that, you know. And he, he must have been then about 45, something like that. Yeah. Maybe older, maybe 45, 50, something like that. 
So he goes in for his interview and he's having a great interview. And then the, the people that are interviewing him, they said, you know, it's, something seems to be missing. Your, your, your university degree is not here. And my father says, oh, no, 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 it's not there. He says, I don't have a university degree. You don't have a university degree? Why are you applying for this job? He says, because I have a better degree than that. And he went, what? He says, my degree is that I'm the father of 10 children. And I run the football club for the for the church and, you know, and he listed all the things that he did. You know, he's on the Parent Teachers Association and all this, you know. And he said, so that is my education. And I think that trumps a sociology degree. And they looked at each other. And then the next day he got a letter, he got the job, <laughs> you know. And he was in the job just a few weeks and the other staff were looking at him and was like, Who's this old guy? You know, like it was like young social workers. And he said, he came home and he said, you know, these these boys, it was like for uh, Borstal, I don't know what they call that in America, but it's like boys who have been in trouble and then mm-hmm. they're taken out of their family and put into this home and they're, they're taken care of. And it's basically like a jail, but for young kids that are not old enough to be in jail. And he said, and it was true what he'd said several years before, that a lot of these kids get into trouble because they're not loved enough and they're not respected enough and they're not given a chance. So he still had connections with the shipyards. So he asked his boss for permission to take the boys to the shipyards and show them how ships are built. And then there was one time when the ship was getting launched, you know, and they get the bottle of champagne. And he took them to that and they were the VIP guests around the, the VIP person who was smashing the bottle. And the boys were, they started to behave better. You know, before that, they were always, you know, they were smoking and drinking and, and sneaking out and do, doing lots of difficult things. But the boys started to behave better. And within two years, my dad got promoted. He was promoted again and again and again. And within two or three years, he was the boss of that boys home. Amazing. Yeah? I love that story for two main reasons. One, that your dad, I mean, you know, you said he had a passion for working with kids, which he obviously did, but there was, there's an underlying purpose there. You know, it's not just, I love kids and it's fun for me. We, you know, it's, I want to help these kids because I know I see something that they need that would be pretty easy to give them, but I'm the one who sees what's missing, you know? So that to me, it's that sense of purpose, you know, getting, getting into that work. And two, I that he, you know, applied without all the proper qualifications and let his life experience speak for him. That's, that's what we're talking about. You know, he didn't have to go back to school. He didn't have to have, you know, a proper degree. He had the experience. That's a wonderful story. I think sometimes we have to speak up for ourselves. And in today's society, in Western society, it has become too much of degrees, you know, like uh, university degrees and, and, and what mm-hmm. you have on paper rather than what you have in your brain and in your heart, which is more important. And in that situation, if my dad hadn't spoken up, they would have just laughed at him and left. And just think how, how many boys' lives he helped just because he spoke up. So hopefully our leaders, our, not our readers, our, our, um, <laughs> our listeners will think about that and think about how can they help people in society? How can they help people in their, in their neighborhood, their community that they can also monetize and, and get, a, get a job from? Mm-hmm. So it's something that they love and something with purpose. And right. it makes them go home at night with a, a, a nice warm feeling in their heart. Yes. You know? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's why I started this Menopause Morph podcast because I was so fed up when I first, when I started going through perimenopause and I looked online, there was almost nothing for me, for menopausal women. There was, Facebook hadn't started then. <laughs> and there was, everything that was online was dry medical stuff. And it was just for doctors. And I thought, doctors are not, well, there's a few doctors going through menopause, but usually it's not doctors that are going through menopause. It's like women like me. And our biggest question is, when will it end? And, and is this normal or am I going crazy? And, and the husbands are saying, is my wife crazy or is it just me? Because I woke up this morning and it was another woman in bed. It was this evil bitch. <laughs> and these are the practical things that people need answered. And I, you know, I'm the type of person that doesn't, that's, you know, a lot of people say, oh, why is the government not doing this? Or why is my boss not doing this? And I think if nobody else is doing it, I'm going to do it. Yeah. So hopefully our listeners will get the courage from that and say, okay, there's, there's a niche that needs filled. And when I've been doing, the last few years, I've been doing business courses to learn about business. And they say that exactly what you were saying earlier. If you see a need, try and fill it because running a business or doing a job, it's fulfilling somebody's needs. 
It's like if we're hungry, we go to the store, we buy bread and potatoes or whatever. And the, 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 sh- the storekeeper has a need because we're hungry. He sells the food. He makes some profit. Right. So it's like in, in every kind of job, there's always a need that's being fulfilled. And I, that, I think you perfectly tied it into purpose. So it's about not just your enjoyment of it. Yes, we want you to enjoy it. But what does it do outside of yourself? What's the relational connection to someone else? Yeah. So if people want to get in contact with you, if they want some more advice on how they can change their careers and things like that, how would they get in contact with you? Uh, my website is withlaurasims.com. There's a contact page there, or you can find me anywhere on social media uh, using the handle with Laura Sims. Okay. And you have a book. You've written a book. Can you tell us about that? I do. It's called The Purpose Paradigm. And um, I was working with career change clients and the work was going fine, but I felt like we were spending a lot of time kind of reshaping assumptions they had about what a career was or what a career had to be. So I wrote this book for those people so that you can have a more up-to-date, current view of what's happening with careers, what a meaningful career actually looks like, how you might go about finding one, how to evaluate the career you're in now to see where you're out of sync, and really learn more about this concept of working through the lens of purpose, not just through the lens of have to or through the lens of passion, but finding of something that's meaningful for you and, and is going to help somebody else. Excellent. Excellent. And how would, where would they find it? If they want to buy it, where, where would they find it? Just go to withlaurasims.com and there's a little tab at the top that says book and that'll take you right there. Lovely. And is it, is, is it an ebook or is it a printed book? It's yeah, it's digital. Digital book. Okay. So they, e-book. Can, they mm-hmm. can download it immediately and get it. Sometimes I, I, I want to read, read a book so quickly and it's like, oh, it has to come in the post. <laughs> and this, oh. So that's lovely. And is there any last words you would like to say to our listeners. I just, I think your dad is such a good model of, you know, of an inspirational story to take away of, you know, if there's something that you have a lot of life experience with and you have a real care about and concern about, see what you can do to make that part of your career. Even if you don't have the credentials or you don't have, you know, something that, that other people who you might be competing with have, that sense of purpose and that life experience goes a long way. It does it certainly does, and you know he was in that job for oh I can't quite quite a few years, and then he began to get a bit ill. You know he was getting older, and and it was he he transferred, and then he was looking after old people, and just at the bottom of our street, so he just was walking like a hundred yards to work, and then he his heart started to go. You know he had a few heart attacks, and so he retired. But he's still on the go. He's like how old is he now? Um, Seventy eight. Oh no, he's going to be eighty this year. It's going to be 80 this year. And I tell you a lovely little story. He and my mother, they were alive. They were, of course, they were alive. <laughs> we were all alive. Um, they were like childhood sweethearts. You know, they met just, uh, you know, around about school. Well, he had left school. He started to work and she was just at school. And, they, you know, they married when he was 20. She was 21. They had 10 kids. They were married for 53 years and then she died. You know, and she was ill for mm. many years. She had MS. And he cared for her so much. You cannot believe it you know the last two years she was in a hospice and three times a day he would go to the hospital and visit her three times a day and he wouldn't like he he couldn't come and visit me in Iceland we we had a big celebration for my son when he was 14 this firming thing my dad said no I can't come because who's going to visit your mum I have to visit your mum every day so he was completely completely devoted to her and then when she died of course we knew that she was dying but still it was it was devastating for him and he kind of like went down a little bit you know it started getting sad and you know you know he was cheery but really he was giving up slowly and then about a few years later he met this lady and she was 70 and well, almost 70 and, and he was 78 77 and they got married two years ago oh. <laughs> and now and and he became like a teenager again it's like oh he's doing this for me and Liz Ray's came in to do that for me and, and I and I'm thinking mm, something going on here and sure enough they got married <laughs> and now and she's really taking care of his health and he's lost I think it was like three stone that's like what's that in pounds like that's a lot of pounds isn't it you know I think it's is there 14 pounds in a stone or something like that I don't know I'm in kilograms over here in, in Iceland <laughs> you know but basically like in dress sizes it would be like if it was wearing a dress it would probably be three dress sizes uh-huh. he's lost you know and every time I phone him he said oh I've, I'm this amount around my belly now you know <laughs> 
<laughs> and so that's like he's going to be eighty. And so and and you know what? They they live in a, a a it's like a complex of old people where they have these emergency cords. You know, if you're sick or something. But they don't feel old, and they run a club for the old people, and they take care of the old people, and they do bingo, and they're like social workers now, but they're you know. <laughs> And you know, he, you know, what? Some many times I phone and they're not home. He, he's not into this mobile phone thing, you know. He can't handle that, you know. So when I phone, he's out and he said, "Oh no, no, I, I was out today. I was, we were running the bingo, or we were taking the old people on a trip to Loch Lomond, or you know, it's like." <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, like those old people, <laughs> exactly. You know, so no matter if you're eighty or whatever age, it's you're never too young to to find something that is purposeful, that, that makes, gives your life meaning. I think a lot of people, when they retire, they have nothing to do. And you hear statistics of people, they die within the first two or three years of retiring because they have nothing to do. And they have, and, and, but there's so much to be done in the world. There is lots to be done, but they're just not thinking it's a job. You know, it doesn't have to be a job that gets paid. It has to be just something that gives your life purpose. Don't you think? Right. Yeah, I but agree. it's better to get paid for it as well. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's better to get paid for it. You know. Okay, it's been really lovely ha- having you here today, Laura. And I hope listeners will contact you if you because I think the whole, biggest thing holding them back is fear, and it shouldn't be fear. You know, take a deep breath, <sighs> take a deep breath, <sighs> and then go for it. Okay. So, thank you very much. Do you play guitar? Do you sing as well? I do. Will you sing me a little song now? Pauline. Okay, I'll I'll sing you something that I sing to my son a lot. Okay. Okay. The bed is too small for my tired head. Bring me a hill soft with trees. Tuck a cloud up under my chin. Lord, blow the moon out. <laughs> oh that was wonderful so it's been lovely okay. lovely lovely talking with you and singing with you thank you so much you're the Thanks. first person i've got to see <laughs> see you Thanks, thank you and we'll see you all guys in the next episode take care <laughs>